Hey, what's going on, everybody? Listen, man, we are back again this week as we continue to study uh, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Listen, last week, I pray that you guys were blessed by uh, the teaching. I pray that your conversations were blessed. And today we're going to start off right where uh, we left off, talking about salvation. And if you remember, one thing that I expressed last week is that uh, for salvation to take place, a person must acknowledge that they need to be saved. However, we live in a time when people are okay with acknowledging wrong, but not mm, correcting wrong. However, uh, the Bible never calls for us to simply acknowledge that we are sinners and be saved. Instead, what the Bible calls us to do in Acts 2 and 38 is to repent and believe each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, repentance is essential in salvation. In other words, there is no salvation of our sins if our sins aren't forgiven, and there is no forgiveness of our sins if we do not repent. However, while repentance is essential in the conversation of salvation, it seems any more to be absent from the modern conversation. Any more, I have seen so many individuals expressing the gospel or proclaiming the gospel to people, but not acknowledging the call to repent. They'll acknowledge that people uh, have sinned. They'll acknowledge that people have done wrong, but they never call a person to repentance. However, in Acts 3 and 19, we see that it says, therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. Repentance and the gospel go hand in hand. And today we're going to talk about why that is so important. Okay, so to begin, what is repentance? Well, since this is just basic teachings, I'll keep the definition simple, right? It's to change your mind or to turn from, and there's two Greek words that the New Testament uses for repentance, right? And when we look at both of them, we'll get kind of this full idea of repentance. One expresses this idea of concern or care. It, it's the emotional aspect of repentance, which is the feeling of regret or remorse or having done something wrong. Now, interesting enough, this aspect of repentance is accepted by many people. What do I mean by many people? Many people will express feeling bad for something they did. Many people will tell you that it was wrong and that, that afterwards they, they felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And, and then they'll tell you it again. And then they'll, they'll tell you it again. And, and then they'll tell you again. Every time they'll tell you that they felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They felt like they let God down, but yet you'll see a consistent pattern of nothing changing and them continuing to do the same thing. They are okay with the idea of repentance that just is connected with the emotional, I feel bad, or dag, I shouldn't have done that, or dag, that, that made me feel bad. However, that's an incomplete understanding because when we look at how Jesus uses that word, you'll see Jesus stress regret but he'll also stress it to the point that it should produce in us a change. In other words, we shouldn't just feel bad that we did something wrong. We should change the action that we did and turn from it. Matthew 21, 28 through 31. The Bible says this. What do you think? This is Jesus talking. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, my son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind. That's that first Greek word, metamoi, right? He changed his mind and went. Then the man went out to the other side and said the same thing. I will, sir. He answered, but he did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They said, the first, Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Now, notice what Jesus just said. He says that there was a son who didn't want to go into the field. And he said, I don't want to go. But later he changed his mind. That's the repentance. He changed his mind and noticed that he moved from an emotional desire or emotional change. And he did what? He went. He moved from emotion to action. Right. He moved from emotion to action because repentance is more than just a feeling. It is a 
action, to regret, to change the mind, created in him a change of action or a reversal of a non-action. And I think that's important to acknowledge too, because sometimes when we talk about repentance, we only talk about stopping doing something. However, we also need to think about repentance in the way of not just stopping doing something wrong, but doing something that, but to start doing something rather that I should do. Now, I want us not to miss the end of this parable though, because Jesus talks about another son. And notice what's up with this son. This son doesn't say he doesn't want to. He tells his father, I'll go do it. And then he never does it, right? So he, he talked a good talk, but his talk didn't produce action. And, and notice that Jesus says that that son is like the Pharisees, the ones who do all the talking, but don't do anything. The ones who tell people what to do, but don't do it themselves. He says that son is like the Pharisees. And he says that the son that repented will be like the prostitutes and the, and the tax collectors that will get into heaven. Why? Because their actions follow their words. They didn't just talk the talk, but they come on, walk the walk. That's that full picture <clears throat> of what it means to repent. Yes, I feel bad, but that moves me to changing. I'm not just going to talk the talk because it sounds good. I know all the good things to say to make a person believe that I really am feeling bad about what I did, but then you don't do anything with the talk. And so Jesus says, that's what the hypocrites and the Pharisees do. That's what the people who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven do. But the people who take that regret, take that emotional feeling after doing something wrong and it produces in them a change, those individuals inherit the kingdom of heaven because it's not about walking perfect, but it's about acknowledging wrong when we do and turning from it. The second Greek word talks in a similar way, and it means just to think differently about something or, or, or to have a change in mind. See, it's, it's a little bit similar, but 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 it's the literal word that we see in the Bible when it says repent. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you look at that in context... Peter was talking to a, a group of Jews who had just previously killed Jesus and he's and they refused to acknowledge that he was the Messiah and he's preaching a sermon to them and he's telling them to repent and be baptized. The call here there is to think differently about Christ specifically. Think differently. Think differently. The call to repent is to think differently, to change the way I think about something. And so while this is a similar meaning, it is essential to address the difference between the first usage and the second usage. And what that means is that in order for a person to be saved, they must first think differently. In order for a person to accept Christ, they must first think differently. In order for you to turn from your sins, to stop getting drunk, cheating, fornicating, lying, and treating people bad, there must be a change in how we think about our sin. For many people, sin is not lessening in their life because of how they view it. In other words, we we put these levels on sin and it's like, well, it, I didn't do that. That It wasn't that. At least I didn't do that. Or at least, no, no, no. It's all sin. It's all sin. Here's a question I want you guys to ask. Discuss this. How does this aspect of repentance change how you understand the importance of repentance? Are you stuck and feeling bad, but not turning? Are you talking good, but not walking? What is stopping you or what do you think is stopping others from moving from regret to change, talking to walking? All right. Now, as we examine this matter of repentance, we cannot avoid being impressed with the importance of repentance as a prerequisite for salvation. Yes, I said it is a prerequisite for salvation. Wait a minute. You're telling me that salvation is not by grace through faith alone. Absolutely. Salvation is by grace through faith alone, but it is repentance is still a re we prerequisite for salvation. And we're about to talk about that. First, let me just give you some scriptures. Acts 3.19. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. Romans 2.4. Or do you despair, despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to what? 
repentance. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord does not de delay his promise as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to what? Repentance. And those are just some verses to show you that from the gospels to the, to, to the epistles, that the call to repent or to return is associated with salvation. It's connected. You can't talk salvation without talking repentance and you can't talk repentance without producing salvation. So and many yes. people don't talk about it. Instead, what you get is, is people will say something like, just, just, just come to Jesus because he loves you. And if you just believe the gospel, you'll be saved. Sure, that's part of it. But repeatedly, the call has been not to just believe, but to repent and believe. Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. Listen, any conception of faith, not wedded to repentance and the gospel falls short of the full biblical message. It's not that you're not saying something that is true. It's that you're not giving a person the full truth. If you do not acknowledge, do not insert, do not proclaim to the person along with the gospel message that there must be repentance and belief. Discuss this. Why do you think that people don't call people to repentance when presenting the gospel? Do you? And, and, and what about the believer? Why do people not call the believer who sins to repentance? Now, I want to talk about what it means to turn. Because it's, it's one thing to say that a person must repent or change their mind, which leads to turning from uh, or a turning to. However, we can turn from one thing right to another thing. For example, people turn from wrong to lesser wrongs that is still wrong all the time. And so the call to turn is explained best in Acts 3.19 and in Acts 26, 18 and 20. And don't forget, I'm going, I'm connecting this to why salvation and repentance is uh, why repentance is a prerequisite for salvation, right? First Peter again says it's a repeat a repeated verse, three nine Acts 3.19. Therefore, what repent and turn so that your sins may be wiped out. Now, Peter is speaking to a specific Jewish audience, right? And he's accusing them of what? Walking away from God. And so he tells them that the Messiah had to come and suffer. Therefore, turn now, repent, and turn back. Turn back to where? To God. So the subject of our turning is to God, not to a lesser wrong. When we talk about turning, we're saying turn to God. And so we have to ask ourselves, right? When, when, when we're turning, are, 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 are we turning from sin to God or are we turning from sin to a lesser sin? We have to ask ourselves, are, are, are we turning from pornography to masturbation? Are we turning from committing violence to thinking violence? Are we turning from adultery and fornication to lust? Well, we're, we're, we're not called to just turn from sin, but to turn from sin to God. This means that whatever previous thing we were doing or thinking, we have to ask ourselves, is the next thing something that God approves of or the world or flesh and culture? Now, to be clear, Peter is not claiming that we were all with God from the beginning. No, 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 no. Peter is talking to a Jewish audience who are the chosen people of God, who did belong to God, who turned away from God, and he's telling them to turn back to God, okay? In context, right? But in context, that also asks the question or acknowledges the believer today. It, it, maybe you're watching this and you've turned away from God. Well, the Bible is calling you to repent and come back. Not just go back to church, but to repent of the lifestyle that you turned away from God for and come back. Turn back from the world and the flesh and return to God. Now, Paul explains what that turning looks like for the unbeliever. In Acts 26, 15 and 18, he says, uh, he, he says, as he's telling his story of conversion, I ask, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint to you as to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. Here it is. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
So here Paul explains that Jesus said to him that he's sending him to open the eyes of the people that they may turn, repent from the darkness and the power of Satan to God. And so when we're proclaiming the gospel to the unbeliever, we're calling them to not just believe on Christ, but to leave a lifestyle of sin, death and darkness and turn to a life of life in the light of Christ. What, 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 what Peter and Paul are doing in every other biblical author is that they're calling the unbeliever to repent and believe by calling them to turn away from darkness and sin to life and righteousness. That's the call. And Jesus says, I'm sending you out there to do that. So when we go out there and we don't put the repentance on the gospel, we are not doing what Jesus called us to go and do. And I get it. It's, it, it's more negative. It's more, it creates more conflict to tell somebody they have to change the way they live. But it does equal damage to not tell them that and have them thinking that they're okay in the lifestyle that they're in. You can't serve two masters. And the reason that the unbeliever must turn to God from their sin, from their lifestyle, is because you can't serve two masters. You can't have the world in God. The call to repent is a call to turn away from the world towards God, period. And we'll talk next week about uh, uh, the belief part. But I want you to notice that belief and repentance are connected. This is why repentance is the prerequisite for salvation, because they are connected. Repentance is the evidence of belief. Now, again, I, 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 I want to stress that. Right. Because I, 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 when I say that, people assume that, that I'm somehow saying that we're not saved by by grace and through faith, but we're saved by works. But that's not what I'm saying. In fact, the problem is that people have taken the message of grace to mean the absence of work. And that is what's leading people to death, thinking they're alive. But Paul says this in Acts 26, 20, instead, I preach to those in Damascus first and those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should, here it is, repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. He says that was his message. Notice that Paul says he preached repentance, turning to God to do the works worthy of repentance. In other words, repent, believe, and live a life that resembles true repentance. In other words, how we walk reveals if we turned away from something and to God. That's the connection. And I'm not saying that there's not progressive sanctification happening and that we don't fall in struggle at time. But what I'm saying is that the fact that we may fall in struggle at time does not mean that we shouldn't strive and walk in obedience. Paul preached that converts should prove their repentance by their deeds, should prove their repentance by their deeds. James says what? Faith without works is dead, right? They are connected. And this concept does not contradict the doctrine of justification by faith through grace alone. However, when you read what Paul says, the doctrine of faith has always required a faith that was ready to obey. Romans 1 through 5, through him, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the Gentiles. The obedience of faith. What's my point? My point is that to believe without repentance is not true belief. And that, and that may not get your conversion numbers up and it may make you wrestle and, and move and you see the little bit, but it's the truth. Right. It's the truth that anybody that says they believe without repenting is lying to themselves because belief and repentance are together. Repentance is the prerequisite for salvation for more than one reason. One reason, because until I change the way I think about my sin, I'll never even come to Christ. The other one is because uh, um, a turning re is required in order to believe. And so if this is true and if meaning sense, we have to bring back to the to the conversation the importance of repentance in the gospel. We have to bring, bring back in the conversation the importance of repentance to the unbeliever who is going astray. 
We can't just keep reminding people that 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 God loves them. We have to remind them that your that your love back to him is resembled in your obedience to him. And so I want you to know that God loves you, but I also want you to know that you should be loving God. And that means turn from the things that you're doing that are against him and turn to him. I'm calling every believer to not just repent emotionally, but to, to move it from emotion to action. I'm calling every believer to share the gospel and to stop leaving out the essential component of repentance. All right, guys, discuss this. If a person refuses to repent, do you think they are saved? If repentance is turning, how does repentance play a vital role in not sinning? All right. And so that's our that's our lesson for the day on repentance. I pray that it blessed you. Man, I just pray that you at least got from this one what it is that repentance means and how important it is uh, in our gospel proclamation and for salvation and how important it is in our sanctification journey. And so, listen, next week, we'll talk about the belief part of repentance because they're connected. They're all part of the conversation of conversion. Right. To, and conversion requires repentance and belief, repentance and faith. And so next week we'll talk about the belief part. So I hope you guys have a great discussion. I hope you guys have.